everybody. Today's practice problem comes from Economics, Principles, and Applications by Robert Hall and Mark Lieberman. We're working with the sixth edition, and we're going to be doing chapter six, problem number 13. The problem begins with the following. It says, draw a budget line for Cameron, who has a monthly income of $100. Assume that he buys steak and potatoes, and that steak costs $10 per pound, and potatoes cost $2 per pound. Okay, so, so we have an, some information we want to keep track of. But we've got an income for Cameron of $100. Our two goods are going to be steak and potatoes, so just call them S and P. And we can say that the price of steak, we said was $10 per pound, so the price of steak is $10. And we said the potatoes cost two dollars per pound. So the price of potatoes is two dollars. So our first assignment is to just make our budget line, right? And we said before that our budget line just represents the price of the thing on the x-axis times the quantity of the thing on the x-axis. So I guess since it's individual quantity consumed, I'll put a little q, that that's just going to be your spending on the good on the x-axis. And then we have, we're adding in the price of the good on the y-axis times the quantity consumed of the good on the y-axis, because that's going to be how much money you're spending on the thing on the y-axis. And the thing about the budget line is that it is assuming that you're spending all of your income, so these two things have to add to your income. So in this case, the line that we would be looking for depending on how we put steak and potatoes, you know, one of the judgment calls that we have to make is whether we put steak on the y-axis and potatoes on the x-axis or vice versa. What you can just do is just pick one way to do it unless the problem specifically says otherwise and then just make sure that you're consistent in what you're doing and you're actually answering the question in the precise way that it's being asked. So here maybe, maybe I would just put, I don't know why, but I feel like putting steak on the y-axis. I have no idea why. So let's just do like this. If I'm graphing like this, then what this would actually mean is that the price of potatoes, which is two, times the quantity of potatoes, maybe just call that P, plus the price of steak, which is 10, times the quantity of steak, just call that S, is gonna equal 100. So that's just the budget line that we're trying to plot here. And you can see this is essentially 2x plus 10y equals 100. And you can just think about how to plot that. Or you could just notice that we're going to get a line that's sloping down and to the right. And because it's going to be a line, we could just figure out where it hits the axes and then connect the dots. So here, if we were going to think about where it hits down on this p-axis, this is just going to be where s is 0, right? So if we said s is 0, then this whole part of our equation drops out. And it has to be the case that we're spending all of our money on potatoes. So 2p has to equal 100, or p has to equal 50. So we could put here, you know, say 50 is right here in the middle. We'd have to have a point on our budget line that would look like this. And we could do the same thing on the other axis, but the point on the s-axis is where p is equal to 0. So if I were to say p equals 0, then this part here drops out, and I just get 10s equals 100, or s equals 10. And again, let me just say that maybe 10 is just here. It's not perfectly to scale. But then we have our budget line call this BC1 for budget constraint 1, that looks like this here. So that wasn't too bad. And you'll also notice that our intercept here is just our income divided by the price of the good on the x-axis. So there's 100 divided by 2. And our intercept here is, again, just our income divided by the price of the good on the y-axis, this time 100 divided by 10. So you'll notice that I cleaned this up a bit. I took away our calculations here, but I left our budget constraint where it was. I just changed the scale a little bit of our graph. 
because I noticed that in the later part of the problem, we were going to be shifting the budget constraint in, and I just wanted to make sure there was room. So far, here's what our budget line looks like. The next thing that we were asked to do is it says add an indifference curve for Cameron that is tangent to his bud budget line at the combination of 5 pounds of steak and 25 pounds of potatoes. So we can think about 5 pounds of steak is about here, and 25 pounds of potatoes is about here. So the point on the budget line that we're looking for tangency is about here, right? So all we have to do is draw an indifference curve that's tangent at this point. And we know a few things about indifference curves. We know that they slope downwards, because we have trade-offs between one good and another. If we're indifferent between two points, and we have more of one good, we must have less of the other good. And we also know that they're bowed in towards the origin. So if we have a typical looking indifference curve, we would draw something that looks like this here. Let's call this IC1, IC just for indifference curve. And to say that something is tangent, it means that it just touches at that one particular point, so that it's basically just kissing the budget line here. So again, this is entirely qualitative and illustrative, but this is something that we've decided under certain assumptions is what a reasonable indifference curve would look like. The next part of the problem says, draw a new budget line for Cameron if his monthly income falls to $80. And then it asks us some more stuff, but let's at least start with that. So now, we notice none of the prices of our goods have changed. It's only our income that's changed. So if this is our budget constraint one, then it must be the case that what I'll call our budget constraint two, or our new budget constraint, is just 2p plus 10s equals 80, right? So we can think about how to graph this guy, and we'll notice that it actually has the same slope as the original budget constraint, which is not surprising because we did learn that shifts in income just result in a parallel shift of the budget line or budget constraint. But again, let's use our tried and true method to see where our budget constraint hits our axes and then go from there. So again here, down here we have the point on our p-axis where s is equal to zero. So if s is zero, this drops out, we get 2p equals 80, or p equals 40. So our new point is about here, on the p-axis. And then on the s-axis here, this is just where p is equal to 0. So if p is equal to 0, this part drops out, and we get 10s equals 80, or s equals 8. It's probably about here. Now these numbers shouldn't be terribly surprising, because basically our income went down by 20%, right? So if our income went down by 20%, then the amount of the goods that we are able to afford goes down by 20%. And 50 minus 20% of 50 is 40. 10 minus 20% of 10 is 8. And we get a new budget constraint that looks like this here. And this confirmed our suspicion that when all we have is an income change, we just get a parallel shift of our budget constraint. And we can see that decreases in income result in shifts towards the origin or a decrease in our possible consumption possible, you know, our possible consumption choices. An increase in income, on the other hand, would shift the budget constraint away from the origin, therefore increasing our set of potential consumption choices. Our next instruction says, assume that potatoes are an inferior good to Cameron. So it's worth thinking about what an inferior good is. We said 
An inferior good is one where income and demand move in opposite directions. So an inferior good is one where an increase in income is going to lead to a decrease in demand. And similarly, or vice versa rather, a decrease in income is going to lead to an increase in demand. Now when we're thinking about our consumer choice model here, we can interpret this as inferior goods when you have an increase in income that's going to be a decrease in quantity consumed. And here when you have a decrease in income, you're going to have an in increase in quantity consumed. And you can compare this to a normal good. And normal goods are the goods where income and quantity consumed or income and demand move in the same direction rather than in opposite directions. Right? So we're told here that it's the potatoes that are an inferior good. So the good here is our inferior good. It says, draw a new indifference curve tangent to his new budget constraints that reflects this inferiority. So we have to draw an indifference curve that's tangent to this new budget constraint where because of this income decrease, he's actually consuming more potatoes than he was before. Because we're basically in this situation here. So we say it has to be tangent at some point to the right of this dashed line at this 25, right? So we can think about how to make that happen. And it's generally helpful to sort of start at the point of tangency and work from there. So let's say we make the point of tangency here. That we can make an indifference curve. Remember, they can't cross. They have to be somewhat concentric, but at least roughly speaking, you could make something that looks like this here. I'll just call this IC2. Maybe not perfect, but you can see what I'm going for. You can see how I'm at least trying to have this be the point of tangency. And here, what we notice is that because of our decrease in income, we actually got an increase in the quantity consumed of our inferior good like we wanted, and we got a decrease in the quantity consumed of the other good. So we can actually conclude from this that this other good is a normal good, because if you think about it, you can't have two goods both be inferior goods, because that would imply that when you have a decrease in income, you're consuming more of both goods, which you just mathematically can't do, right? So if the potatoes are going to be an inferior good, it must be the case that steak is a normal good, and that's consistent with what we're seeing here. Now, the last part of the question says, what will happen to Cameron's potato consumption? Well, we knew what was going to happen to Cameron's potato consumption simply from the definition of inferior good. We can also just read that from the graph here. Like we said, his potato consumption is going to increase. And we said, by definition, his steak consumption was going to decrease. Again, we can see that again because we've moved from five pounds of steak to some quantity here that's clearly less than five. 